please send, send us an email. And uh, we'd like you to please take two minutes to fill uh, the feedback survey for this talk. This helps us a lot to, to improve and make things always better uh, to all of you. Uh, a little uh, Zoom education for you to be able to see the entire screen of Dr. Merrill, please click on uh, view options. And after that, click on side-by-side -side mode. In this, in this way, you're not going to have any part of your screen uh, blocked. And if you want to talk to us during this meeting, please text on the chat box. You can text uh, where are you from, who, uh, who are with you watching us, and anything that you want to tell us. But please uh, click on all attendees and panelists so everybody can see what you're writing. And if you have specific questions during this presentation, please uh, uh, type your uh, questions on the Q&A box, and we are going to ask them live in the end of the session. And uh, Dr. Mary will kindly stay after the meeting answering every question that you have. So please use the Q&A uh, chat box and we are going to be happy to, to answer you. Uh, I'm going to announce you our next activities from Congenital Heart Academy. We are continuing with the morphology series of Dr. Uh, Robert Anderson. This has been amazing. Uh, I wish all of you can uh, watch and continue in the subject that Dr. Merrill is going to bring to us today. Dr. Anderson is going to talk about the morphology of double outlet right ventricle next uh, Friday. Uh, please register uh, for that. We are going to uh, have the second meeting of Dr. Silverman, his imaging series. He makes a correlation of morphology and image. So the next one is going to be on the 3rd of August, and we are going to talk about transposition. We have our master, oh, I'm sorry, it was not here. Uh, previous, okay. We have our master class of sudden death and uh, arrhythmias. Please uh, join us. And it's going to be on Thursday, the 6th of August. It's going to be very special, very nice uh, speakers. Now, uh, with you, Dr. Mary Cohen, she's going to talk about uh, echocardiography features of double outlet right ventricle. And after she finishes her talk, we are going to have a case presentation uh, from Dr. Uh, Vanessa Canuto. She is a uh, uh, pediatric cardiologist and echocardiographist from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in the end, we are going to open to live questions. I hope all of you have a very nice uh, webinar. Dr. Mero, thank you again for being with us. This is a big pleasure. Thank you, Grace and Sasha, once again, for allowing me to uh, do this with you and with uh, the whole group. Anyone who's joined, welcome and thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Can someone tell me if they can see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you, Sasha. All right, you're going to uh, welcome everybody uh, to Congenital Heart Society. Um, and thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, the, you're going to get a lecture next week by, by Professor Anderson. Um, and just to, uh, give you some disclosure, we have a little bit of a different viewpoint about double outlet right ventricle. It's one of the most controversial lesions that exists uh, in, our, in uh, congenital heart disease. So I'm really gonna talk to you about what it takes to an imaging assessment to help you decide um, uh, for appropriate biventricular repair. I'm gonna start by just talking about ventricular arterial alignments. Uh, of which there are essentially four types. You can have concordant alignment, which you see in normally related great arteries, as well as in the very rare lesion of anatomically corrected malposition, because in that lesion, the aorta still arises from the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery arises from the right ventricle. You can of course have discordant alignment. We've spent extensive amount of time in previous uh, webinars talking about transposition of the great arteries. And then you can have double outlet ventricle. That can be double outlet right ventricle, which is much more common, of course, than double outlet left ventricle. And in some cases, it's actually quite challenging to decide where the great arteries are arising. And some people call this double outlet infundibulum. And then of course, you can have a common arterial trunk such as you see in truncus arteriosus. And other than the common arterial trunk, there really can be quite a bit of spectrum uh, of these diseases with each other. 
And I'm going to start to, by highlighting uh, a case. So here, this was a two month old who presented to us, this is now almost a decade ago. And here is an apical four chamber view and a parasternal long axis view. The patient had heart failure. And what you'll see in this uh, fairly extensive apical sweep is the left side is big because of the VSD physiology. You can see the aorta looks more rightward than you would expect it to look. And the pulmonary artery is a little bit more leftward than you would expect it to look. They're still normally related to each other, but they don't look quite right. Um, and if you look at the parasternal long axis view, you'll note that the aorta, when we sweep back, there's mitral to aortic continuity here, but the aorta looks like it's mostly coming from the it could be coming from either one. And the pulmonary artery, it's actually quite hard to tell where it's coming from. And various people looked at these images and the differential diagnosis was honestly dependent on the imager. Some called it double, when well, a patient arrived with a diagnosis of double outlet right ventricle, someone called it tetralogy of Fallot and others called it double outlet left ventricle. The surgeon, um, without additional imaging, did a VSD patch to the aorta and a right ventricular outflow tract patch, so treated it similar to Tetralogy of Fallot. And what you'll see is the result of that surgery. Unfortunately, the surgeon patched the VSD, which now included the aorta and the pulmonary artery on the LV side. So it was certainly, it was certainly double outlet left ventricle now. And honestly, the only way the patient was sort of around and surviving was that there were two residual VSDs around the patch that were allowing blood to get into the pulmonary artery. And so this just shows you the challenge we sometimes have using two-dimensional imaging to try to image a very three-dimensional structure. So the definition of double outlet right ventricle <clears throat> is when both great vessels uh, entirely or primarily arise or from or align with the right ventricle. In cardiac development, all hearts start out with double outlet right ventricle and eventually the aorta makes its way to wedge between the mitral valve and the ventricular septum. It's important to understand that double outlet right ventricle is only a label. It does not give us enough information because it doesn't adequately describe the anatomical detail or the physiology of the patient. And there is tremendous controversy over this particular lesion, um, particularly Van Pragian uh, versus Andersonian. Um, and uh, it has gotten the appropriate name of morphogenetic monster because uh, of all of this controversy. So with regard to ventriculo-arterial alignment, um, I really describe it as assignment rather than alignment because it's how the great arteries, how we assign them to the underlying ventricles. One must understand that it is, not, it is a continuum. It is not a rigid relationship. It's the only time it's a rigid relationship is in a pathologic specimen. And VSDs, ventricular septal defects, and outflow tracts are often arbitrary lines in space. Um, and it's important to understand when we talk about this assignment or alignment, it does not describe infundibular anatomy, which is quite important in double outlet ventricle. And as many of you are aware, and this is gonna be somewhat of a review, there are two strategies of designation. There is the Andersonian 50% rule for both great arteries under all conditions. So if an artery is more than 50% over a particular ventricle, it is assigned to that ventricle. And the von Pragian weinberg approach is more that there's one particular rule that can't be broken, which is if there's mitral to aortic fibrous continuity, we always assign that uh, aorta to the left ventricle. We use the 50% rule for the pulmonary artery and also use the 50% rule if there is discontinuity between uh, the mitral and the aortic valves. So talking about that VSD versus arbitrary line, if you decided in that patient, that case I just showed you, that this is where the VSD was, then you would call this double outlet left ventricle. If in this frozen picture, you decided that this is where the ventricular septal defect is, then you would call this transposition. 
And if you decided that this is where the VSD is, you would call this double outlet right ventricle. And this is just to highlight that VSDs and outflow tracts can be arbitrarily drawn. And obviously one image uh, cannot help us make that diagnosis. And so for those of you who follow the more Andersonian approach, um, I just want to um, describe to you how we assign a double outlet right ventricle using the von Prague approach, which is that if the pulmonary artery sits more than 50% over the right ventricle, we assign it there. And if there is discontinuity between the left ventricle, the mitral valve and the aortic valve, uh, and the aorta is sitting more than 50% over uh, the ventricular septum towards the RV, then we consider that double outlet right ventricle. And this comes from a number of studies, but particularly from the von Prague study of over 100 autopsy specimens of double outlet right ventricle, a, a landmark paper from the early 80s. Now, there are problems with this designation, and many of you will, will, could voice that. Um, so here you see fibrous continuity between the mitral valve and the aortic valve, but you can see that the ventricular septum is not a straight line, it's curved, and this aorta sits almost a lot over the right ventricle, and so some people might designate this as, as sitting over the right ventricle. But there are issues with the 50% rule as well. It does provide a definition of assignment, but it also imposes <clears throat> this arbitrary boundary within the spectrum of alignments. <clears throat> and some great arteries may have biventricular alignment. And I would argue that in Tetralogy of Fallot, it's often a biventricular alignment. And it, it can be impractical, impractical in the living patient because the degree of override of a great artery may change with translational motion in the cardiac cycle. So here is the 50% rule. And just take note of the fact that this is sort of what you would see in a parasternal short axis view on echocardiography. And you can see in the normal heart, if you look up the barrel of the left ventricle, you don't see the entire aortic annulus because it is, an, is partially overriding the ventricular septum where the membranous septum sits, such that if you have a perimembranous VSD, some of the aortic annulus will sit in the right ventricle. <clears throat> and you can see that going from this, where the aorta is assigned to the left ventricle, to this, where it's assigned to the right ventricle and called double outlet right ventricle, is quite subtle and can be very challenging from an uh, imaging standpoint. And you could argue in this patient with a membranous VSD that we would generally not assign this to the right ventricle, though it meets that criteria by the rule. And by that criteria, most patients with Tetralogy of Fallot would meet the rule of being double outlet right ventricle. <clears throat> and when you look at translation through the cardiac cycle, systole and diastole, the amount of override changes uh, with each frame. And so it's very hard to know in the moving heart where you should make the assignment. The reason why we make this distinction of mitral to aortic fibrous continuity using the von Prague method is particularly in the case of double outlet right ventricle versus tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, in the von Pragian method, these two lesions should be considered mutually exclusive. And that's because the prognosis is quite different if you have a subarterial infundibulum. In tetralogy of Fallot, subaortic obstruction is very, very rare. But in double outlet right ventricle with a subaortic VSD, subaortic obstruction is a common feature. So a couple of general rules about double outlet right ventricle. You, the first rule is that you need to be consistent in your own rules and that the imager and the surgeon are on the same page, whether that be von Pragian approach or Andersonian approach, whatever it is, the imager and the surgeon need to be in this together. In general, the great vessel that's closer to the ventricular septal defect is usually larger and unobstructed uh, in malalignment type VSD. And the physiology tends to follow the VSD to great artery relationship, sorry, such that if you have a subpulmonary ventricular septal defect, you are likely to have transposition physiology. The VSD in double outlet right ventricle tends to be quite large and may extend to other areas, but it's important to understand that all of these rules can be broken and I've seen them all be broken. A little bit of review of what the infundibulum or conus is 
Infundibulum and conus are interchangeable terms, and it is defined as a subarterial muscular rim that separates the atrioventricular valves from the semilunar valves. In normal heart, there's only subpulmonary infundibulum that you see here surrounded in white. Uh, and that's why you have mitral to aortic fibrous continuity because there's no sub aortic infundibulum. An infundibulum, that muscular rim, <clears throat> tends to put the semilunar valve higher and move it more anterior. And it tends to increase the distance from the VSD to that great artery. Um, and it also is associated with the great artery relationship. The more muscle you have uh, under a great artery, it tends to move that great artery over the right ventricle, of course, in de-looped ventricles. And the less muscle, it tends to move that great artery over the left ventricle. To review infundibular anatomy, there are four types. You can have subpulmonary infundibulum, and that's what we see in the normal part. You can also see this in, in Tetralogy of Fallot and other lesions. Subaortic infundibulum only, so there is no infundibulum under the pulmonary valve in this situation, and this is classically seen in transposition of the great arteries. Bilateral infundibulum, muscle under both great arteries, classically is seen in double outlet right ventricle, and bilaterally absent uh, infundibulum is classically seen in double outlet left ventricle. But it is important to understand that in transposition and double outlet right and left ventricle, uh, you can have any infundibular anatomy. In other words, in double outlet right ventricle, you can have, you can have subpulmonary infundibulum only, subaortic infundibulum only, bilaterally present or bilateral absent. But it's much more common to have these that I just showed you. A definition of the infundibular septum. So the septum is the segment of the infundibulum, seen in pink here, that is between the aortic and pulmonary outflows. And in the normal heart, this is a very small structure. But in patients who have malalignment, this structure deviates into an outflow and results in obstruction. Uh, often the semilunar valve on the other side of that deviation is small. And for the aorta, you can also have distal obstruction such as coarctation or interruption of the aortic arch. You can have abnormal attachments of an AV valve to the infundibular septum, and this can affect uh, surgical pathways uh, in biventricular repairs. And the infundibular septum can be absent in certain lesions. It can be absent uh, and cause just a ventricular septal defect. It can be absent in tetralogy of Fallot, and it can be absent in double outlet right ventricle, which is a form of doubly committed uh, VSD. So when we're thinking about repair, biventricular repair of double outlet right ventricle, our goal, our goal and the surgeon's goal is to direct the VSD flow to a great vessel without obstruction or injury to an AV valve. If the aorta is closest to the left ventricle, then this VSD is baffled to the aorta and the right ventricle to pulmonary artery pathway uh, can be opened or left alone depending on the presence of obstruction. If the pulmonary artery is closest to the left ventricle, then this patient is likely to, to need a uh, arterial switch operation. And if both are close to the left ventricle, it may require a Damus K stancil type of procedure with baffle closure to those both great vessels. And if neither are close, such as you've seen in remote VSD, some of those patients will require single ventricle palliation to Fontan. So what does the surgeon need to know? Uh, the VSD is one of the highlight features of double outlet right ventricle. So we need to know the type, the location, which great artery it's closest to, the size, is it large enough to handle a baffle in an unobstructed pathway to that great artery, the distance of the tricuspid valve to the great artery, and if there are multiple VSDs. Infundibular anatomy, which I just went over, which great artery is their infundibulum under, how much muscle is between the VSD and the closest great artery. We wanna know the spatial relationship of the great arteries. Are they anterior or posterior to each other? 
Are they side by side? Do they spiral like in the normal, normally related great arteries or are they parallel similar to what we see in transposition? Is one great artery obstructed? Usually that's the furthest one from the VSD, but not always. And then with regard to atrioventricular valves, is there a common AV valve? Is there straddling? Are there abnormal attachments to the infundibular septum? Is there a atrioventricular valve hypoplasia or ventricular hypoplasia? And then in the setting of double outlet right ventricle, you can have some other associated lesions such as superior inferior ventricles, dextrocardia, juxtaposition of the atrial appendages, <clears throat> and they're very likely to have coronary anomalies similar to the variations we have shown you in previous um, lectures on transposition of the great arteries. The VSD uh, is designated uh, by its location in relation to the great arteries. So four subtypes, subaortic, subpulmonary, doubly committed or remote, and then also by its anatomic type, outlet malalignment defects where the defect sits between the limbs of the septal band in all except remote uh, defects. And the infundibular septum becomes an RV structure because it's malaligned. Remote defects are either inlet defects uh, or muscular defects. And in very rare cases of double outlet right ventricle, you can have an intact ventricular septum because the infundibular free wall fills in the limbs of the septal band. Subaortic VSD is considered probably the most common. And here you see uh, the ventricular septum in orange, the infundibular septum in pink malaligned uh, towards the right ventricle. It's an outlet malalignment defect. Again, the infundibular septum displaced anteriorly. It's most common in the tetralogy of fallow type of double outlet right ventricle, but both outflows can be unobstructed in the situation. And generally, uh, uh, the surgeon can proceed with VSD baffle or tetralogy of fallow like repair of this lesion. With regard to the subaortic infundibulum, the larger the muscle, the longer the distance between the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve. And this can, of course, lead down the road to subaortic obstruction after repair. <clears throat> so here uh, from our textbook, you see uh, a path specimen of a subaortic VSD and double outlet right ventricle. You can see the VSD and the Y of septal band. You can see the conal or infundibular septum impinging on the pulmonary outflow tract you can see the aorta is sitting entirely over the right ventricle in this case. And here's an echocardiographic example of that. This is a sub xiphoid left anterior oblique view. And as you sweep through, you'll see the aorta first, closest to the VSD and the pulmonary artery, which is quite small in this patient, uh, more anterior. And here you see the very large VSD to the aorta here and the pulmonary artery comes very anteriorly at the end and is quite small. You can also have a subaortic VSD in a patient who has no pulmonary stenosis. And so here is a patient where you see that there is a subaortic infundibulum between the mitral valve and the aortic valve. That's the pulmonary artery here. Here's the aorta and you can see the aorta is arising almost entirely from the right ventricle. And then you see the uh, pulmonary artery coming over the top, also arising from the right ventricle. So this is double outlet right ventricle with no pulmonary stenosis and presents with VSD physiology and usually needs to re be repaired relatively early. These patients can develop subaortic obstruction later. Three-dimensional echocardiography has really enhanced our understanding of this lesion to a great degree because two-dimensional imaging of this very three-dimensional structure is just not enough. And so here you see a sub xiphoid cut where you see the ventricular septal defect leading to the aorta. The pulmonary artery is up here and you can see this very thick rim of muscle uh, as <clears throat> the VSD passes to the aorta and you can see why subaortic obstruction would occur. And this view uh, is even better than what the surgeon gets. It's a version of, of, of a view of the septal surface of the right ventricle. Here you see the VSD and you can see the pathway that would need to be taken to bring the VSD to the aorta. You can see this muscle here is the subarterial infundibulum and how far it 
moves the aorta away from the VSD and also puts the patient at risk for developing obstruction. And here's the right ventricular outflow tract in this case. <clears throat> Just a beautiful demonstration of what the surgeon is going to see when they go in to do repair. Subpulmonary VSD uh, is also an outlet uh, malalignment defect. The infundibulum uh, is displaced quite rightward. Again, here you highlight the ventricular septum in orange, the infundibular septum in pink. This is what we see in the Tausig Bing form of double outlet right ventricle, which is defined as bilateral infundibulum, side by side great arteries, <clears throat> and transposition physiology. In Tausig Bing, uh, often the aortic outflow is smaller, and some of these patients will have coarctation of the aorta as well. The pulmonary artery tends to be the larger great artery in this setting, and the surgeon baffles the VSD to the pulmonary artery and then performs an arterial switch operation in this case. And here again is a path specimen <clears throat> of this type of subpulmonary VSD. Again, you see the VSD, the large VSD in the Y of septal band. Here you see the conal or infundibular septum malaligned very rightward. You see the aorta on the other side. You see the pulmonary artery sitting over the ventricular septal defect. And so this is where the, the VSD would be baffled to the pulmonary artery. <clears throat> and here is an echocardiogram showing that very thing. You see the larger pulmonary artery, the smaller aorta, and you can see that the blood from the left ventricle is entering the pulmonary artery, giving the patient transposition physiology. And again, you see this pathway that would need to be developed and the significant infundibulum there. And here you can see again in this beautiful 3D image, the ventricular septal defect and the subpulmonary and subaortic infundibulum. You see that both great arteries are separated from the AV valves here and that distance uh, can highlight uh, the risk of developing obstruction. There's the pathway. And here again, that septal surface view where you see the VSD and you see uh, the subpulmonary infundibulum and the distance to the pulmonary artery, and there's the aorta. <clears throat> really just beautiful uh, images that really help us understand these lesions. Doubly committed VSD is often confusing to people. It's an, also an outlet malalignment VSD and outflow tract obstruction is more unusual. In this case, the VSD sits under both great arteries, and this can be in two scenarios when you have anterior posterior position of the great arteries or side by side position of the great arteries. And the type of repair depends on the shortest path to a great artery. It can be just a VSD baffle to the aorta. It can require an arterial switch operation, or it may require that both great arteries are uh, anastomosed together and, <clears throat> and the baffle is put to both of them, so DKS. You can damage semilunar valves with the surgery uh, because of, uh, in some cases of the absence of the infundibular septum, such that there's only fibrous continuity between the aortic and the pulmonary valves. And here, this is just a, a view from above to highlight the two different types of doubly committed uh, VSD that you can see in double outlet right ventricle. You can have the more common type, which is absence of the infundibular septum, which you see here, and both great arteries are sitting side by side over the ventricular septal defect, which is shown here in blue or you can have an infundibular septum that is perpendicular to the muscular septum with an anterior posterior relationship of the great arteries. So here is the absence of the infundibular septum type of doubly committed uh, uh, VSD. Here again, you see the VSD in the Y of septal band. Note that the VSD is in the same location in all of these types of double outlet right ventricle, it's the great arteries that are in different uh, locations. The VSD is in the same place. And here you see absence uh, of the infundibular septum such that the aortic and pulmonary valves are in fibrous continuity. And you can see that here uh, in this uh, sub xiphoid view that again, you see that there is absence of the infundibular septum and the great uh, arteries are at the same level. And you can see that they're relatively equidistant uh, from the, the crest of the ventricular septum. And here you see that in motion. Again, no infundibular septum seen here. 
Uh, and if you watch this sweep in apical four chamber view, you will also see absence of the infundibular septum and both great arteries sitting pretty close to the ventricular septal defect. This is the rarer type, which is the perpendicular infundibulum. And I'm showing you in freeze frame first. Here you see uh, the pulmonary artery is related to the VSD. And here you see the aorta is also related to the VSD. The aorta in this case is directly anterior to the pulmonary artery. And here is that same pa patient um, in a sweep, a sub xiphoid sweep. <clears throat> you go through the PA to the aorta quite quickly. This patient also has juxtaposition of the atrial appendages, which you see here. And then you'll see the pulmonary artery quickly and then the aorta. Um, and they're both anterior posterior to each other and both related to the VSD. Remote ventricular septal defect is either inlet or muscular type. And you can see commonly in superior inferior ventricles. And this is the most challenging to baffle the VSD to a great artery. It is a long pathway at risk for obstruction. You may have to enlarge the VSD or actually close that portion of the VSD and create a new VSD to baffle uh, to a great artery. And an AV valve is often in the way. Many of these patients will go on to have single ventricle palliation. And so here you see the aorta and the pulmonary artery, a large infundibular or conal septum here, and the VSD is sitting very far away and you would be very damaging AV valve uh, in any way trying to baffle this VSD to either of those great arteries. Here's an example of a remote VSD. You could be fooled into thinking that the VSD is related to, to one of the great arteries here, but in fact, uh, as you sweep by, you see the VSD first, and then by the time you see the great arteries, the VSD is gone, and that's because in this apical four chamber view, you can see this is an inlet type VSD, and the great arteries sit very anterior away from the ventricular septal defect. So are we accurate in our diagnosis? Um, one of the cardiology fellows in my program, Jess Tang, put together uh, an abstract that we presented last year at the AHA. We looked at 215 double outlet right ventricle patients who underwent biventricular repair at CHOP or Boston Children's Hospital. And of those, 43% had a discrepancy in the in diagnosis at the initial transthoracic echo compared to either subsequent imaging or the operative report, a very high number. 12% had a significant discrepancy. And in two of the total uh, 215 patients, the surgical strategy was impacted. So you can see that two-dimensional imaging can really challenge us in how we describe this, uh, this disorder. There are some AV valve anomalies that are highly associated with double outlet right ventricle. Common AV valve, likely seen in heterotaxy or isomerism, may be unbalanced over one ventricle. It has a tendency to be regurgitant, and it's very difficult to get the posterior VSD to an anterior great vessel uh, without obstruction. And here uh, is an example of a common AV valve and both great arteries sitting entirely over the right ventricle in this case. Here again, you see common AV canal, and then both great arteries uh, arising from the right ventricle in a patient with heterotaxy syndrome. And you can see that trying to get to a great artery without causing damage to an AV valve would be quite challenging. And here's a three-dimensional imaging of that very same thing. Here are the two outflows, here's the conal septum, and here's the common AV valve uh, in, in both of these cases. Straddling mitral valve, uh, mitral valve straddles through an, a malalignment type VSD. Most typically when the ventricular, the crest of the ventricular septum is malaligned with the infundibular septum, you can see attachments to the crest of the ventricular septum or into the right ventricle. It can look uh, on echocardiography like a cleft mitral valve and often we'll only see one papillary muscle in the left ventricle. Um, if it is misdiagnosed or, or, or if, if, the, if it is not diagnosed um, and a two ventricle repair is performed, it can result in left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and or significant mitral regurgitation when trying to do that baffle. It's important to recognize that it's seen in about 20% of patients with Tausig Bing anomaly. And here uh, is an example uh, of a straddling mitral valve where you see the 
ventricular septum here, the infundibular septum here, malaligned. Here's the double outlet uh, right ventricle. And you can see the mitral valve sort of sitting almost on the crest of the ventricular septum. And in this apical four chamber view, you can see the mitral valve is directed over the ventricular septum with left ventricular uh, hypoplasia. And here just highlights again, that mitral valve sitting over the crest of the ventricular septum uh, and the single papillary muscle that you see. Other associated anomalies, double outlet right ventricle can be seen in association with mitral atresia or mitral hypoplasia. As you see here, the left ventricle is always small in this situation. Here you see the mitral valve is very tiny compared to the tricuspid valve in the sub xiphoid sweep. And these patients always require a single ventricle strategy. In superior inferior ventricles, the left ventricle sit, typically sits along the diaphragm and the right ventricle sits on top. And because of that, many of these patients have double outlet uh, right ventricle. You can see that there. You can see the ventricular septum is in a very weird position from normal um, in this patient. And finally, because I've alluded to the fact that two-dimensional imaging is probably not completely adequate for us to determine two ventricle repair in some subsets of patients with double outlet right ventricle, not all. You can do some three-dimensional modeling and printing that can be very helpful. And our group does this type of modeling quite uh, often. And I wanna thank uh, one of our former fellows, Rena Ghosh, who put this together for me. Uh, but here's a patient who has double outlet right ventricle where we were having trouble determining which great artery was closest to uh, the ventricular septal defect. And you can see with this virtual reality, we can dive in here. The blue ring is the tricuspid valve. The yellow ring is the mitral valve. The purple ring is the aorta. And the pink ring is the pulmonary artery. You can see the VSD here. <clears throat> you can see the infundibular septum up here. So we're looking from the RV septal surface. Now we're coming around and looking from the LV septal surface. Here's the mitral valve. And you can see the infundibular septum and the pulmonary artery, which is closest to the ventricular septal defect. And in this case, very rarely, the pulmonary artery is smaller than the aorta, even though it's the one sitting closest to the ventricular septal defect. So this type of imaging is very helpful to us and to our surgeons in being able to determine surgical strategy. So in conclusion, DORV is not a physiologic disease, but rather an anatomic description. It's classified uh, anatomically by the VSD location, by the great artery relationship, and the type of surgery is dictated by these findings. There remains tremendous controversy over nomenclature and diagnosis, and uh, that results from the degree of override but it can be overcome by clear, accurate, and concise description of each individual lesion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. You make, uh, you think that uh, there is a controversial, but I'm sure that you remove <laughs> the controversial. We'll see, we'll see what Professor Anderson has to say uh, about that. <laughs> we will pay the price next week with him, no problem. We will. Because um, I've convinced everyone, and so... Now there will be a big problem. <laughs> As first, uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Canuto that uh, she has a case uh, for you. And then uh, I'm sure we, there is already six uh, questions in the question section, answer section. But I have also a lot of questions for you. So I will wait uh, for uh, Vanessa, welcome, if you share your presentation and introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> First, <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today and to have the opportunity to present a case in the section of the Congenital Heart Academy. And I want to thank especially Grace that she, she is a Brazilian in the international scenario. So thank you. She inspired us.
Thank you very much. I'm Vanessa Canuto. I'm a medical assistant of the Ecolab at the Antibazanese Cardiology Institute and at the Universal University Hospital of Sao Paulo University in Sao Paulo, Brazil. My case is about a newborn term, two days of life. The birth weight was 2.8. Gestational age was 39 plus two weeks. This is the third pregnancy of the mother and no abortions. She did a prenatal screening with two obstetric scans, no morphological study. The APGAR score was eight and nine. The baby was with the mother in the ward and at the second day of, li of life, it was heard a murmur. The saturation was 95% and then they asked for an echo. This is the subcostal view. We can see here the IVC anterior and at the left side and the aorta posterior and at the right side. We also can see the brightness of the inside the stomach at the right side. So these are, these are characteristics for cytos inversos. This is another view, subcostal view. We can see most of the heart, including the apex, turning to the right. So this is a dystrocardia. Another subcostal view, we can see both atria and with the color map Doppler, we cannot see any ASD here. This is the four chambers view and we can see the right chambers in the left side and the left chambers in the right side. This is the cytos inversus. And also we can see the RV dilated hypertrophic with blood function. In this view, we are seeing the initial portion of the VSD here. This is another apical anterior view. We see both great vessels connected to the right ventricle. We also can see the obstruction of the right outflow tract with the aliasing of the color map Doppler. These are the parasternal views and the first great vessel is the aorta. We see that it's more connected to the right ventricle than to the left. It is overriding the ventricular, ventricular septum more than 50%. We see the VSD here. And this is another anterior view when, where we can see the pulmonary artery and the obstruction of the right outflow. These are a transverse uh, view of the great arteries. We can see that the pulmonary artery is more anterior and at the right side of the aorta. Here we can see the normal drainage of the pulmonary veins. And also we can see a little bit of the anatomy of the appendage. Here is the aortic arch without obstruction, just the aliasing the left pulmonary artery as we saw before. And in the other video, we can see the brachiocephalic trunk turned to the right, to, to the left. So the arc, arch is turned to the opposite side, to the right. Well, the, this baby was born in the university hospital. We don't have cardiac surgery here. So the baby was referred to a Tessiari Kajoli Center for surgery. And it was done a uh, bleloctalcin shunt some days before. Now the baby has one year and we don't have the follow-up because the family moved to another city far away from Sao Paulo. Unfortunately, in Brazil, we don't have an integrated healthcare system. So we don't have the information about patients who go through another hospital or city. I brought this case because of the heritage of the association in, uh, between Cyrus inverses and Dorf. And I understand that the intercardiac uh, defects are not that challenging, but I brought three points if we can discuss a little bit about it. Uh, the first, if we had the prenatal diagnostic, which kind of counseling we could say for the mother, and uh, considering that we have a cytos inversus dystrocardia in Dorf, what would be the difficulties for the surgery approach in this situation? 
And I don't know if you have this kind of experience, if you have different of the technical ultrasound scans between the public and the private healthcare systems. Uh, this scans no morphological, but we didn't have the diagnostic of this. Thank you very much. Very nice case. Thank you, Vanessa. <clears throat> so a, a couple things I could say. Um, so the patient has both situs and versus totalis and double L right ventricle. So they're not mutually exclusive. The, when you have situs and versus totalis, um, many of those patients have structurally normal hearts, but they can have any heart abnormality that anybody with situs solidus can have. And you could see that sort of every structure in this patient was completely mirror image. You know, the liver was uh, on the left, the stomach was on the right, the arch was <clears throat> mirror image branching, the uh, atria were mirror image, everything was mirror image. And so this is a, uh, a DORV subaortic type with pulmonary stenosis. Um, so I think um, the shunt was an appropriate strategy for this patient in the initial uh, surgery. Some people might do a complete repair in the newborn period, but most would wait. Some, some, would, mm -hmm. some would do it, but some would wait. But this should be able to undergo a two ventricle repair uh, with baffling of the VSD to the aorta and opening up the RV, the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, the one thing I was having trouble seeing is whether you thought there was mitral to aortic fibrous continuity. I couldn't quite tell if there was any muscle under the aorta. If there was, it looked like it was quite small. Um, and so it would be, uh, I think that the prognosis to do a complete repair in a patient like this even with situs and versus is quite good. I think Sasha can comment about uh, how to approach surgery in a patient with uh, situs and versus com compared to situs uh, solidus, because I can't really comment about that. I don't even know if they stand on the other side of the table to do the procedure. So Sasha, do you want to make a comment? Yes, I can tell you I'm left-handed. So for me, work on the other side is uh, not so difficult. As you say, we, I am on the side of people who likes to palliate this. My philosophy is don't touch stable neonate. So of course, if a patient needs, in our experience is, uh, is a patient that uh, will receive a shunt. And then when he grow up, uh, I'm sure it will be as a, as uh, Mary say, a complete correction, but uh, this is uh, probably worldwide, it's not uh, difficult. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. I think uh, that uh, we have uh, also the problem of the counseling, because Mary, uh, probably in US, this uh, problem is uh, going down because the rate of pre-diagnosis pre pre is very high. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that all around the world, as you say, this uh, <clears throat> patient must be well counseling, counseled before the patient uh, is delivered. But, uh, Absolutely, need... yes. And hopefully this would be recognized. Obviously, in a fetal scan, you have to make sure that you understand the fetal lie, where the fetus is lying, to help you be able to accurately diagnose that the patient has situs and versus uh, totalis, because it could be missed as well. One thing that we're, we're bringing to light about situs and versus is that they have ciliary dysfunction. And so a patient like this would need uh, some counseling um, and maybe even a biopsy of the nasal passage to look for ciliary dysfunction. They can have uh, be at risk for developing respiratory infections. Uh, they can be at risk, particularly if they're boys, of sterility. Um, and so these are, these are, it's important in the spectrum of heterotaxy. Uh, situs and versus is sort of at the end of the spectrum. And we used to think that they were completely different diseases, but in fact, there are spectrums probably of similar diseases and mechanism of how they develop. And so those are some of the things in counseling that I would say to a family if I recognize that they had, in addition to the double outlet right ventricle, the situs and versus. <clears throat> 
So there is one question that I, I like also to know by you is uh, Dr. Rezana Gray Mogdam. Uh, he have a major question and he asks, uh, how is your method to define the distance between pulmonary artery and tricuspid valve? And also this is a very good uh, question. How you can, uh, we can say that the size of the BSD is enough and does not to be a lot. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, these are both very challenging questions. And the size of the, the distance between the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve is really telling you about the pathway to the aorta. Wouldn't you say, Sasha? Yes. That's really what you're trying to... So it's all really the same question, is how big is the pathway from the left ventricle to get to the aorta in the subaortic VSD type? Um, and so I think the three-dimensional imaging I showed you really can show you that distance as best as anything can show you. I think those images were extraordinary. Not everybody can get beautiful images like that. They come from mostly from Evelina Children's Hospital in the UK to give them credit. Um, but um, I think three-dimensional imaging will really help us highlight that. But I particularly use sub-xiphoid imaging because I think it can show you both the VSD and the great arteries best in determining that distance. As far as the VSD size goes, it's often a judgment call. Um, what we're trying to figure out is, is the, this long pathway going to be large enough? And the VSD turns out to be the opening of the subaortic region. It becomes the sub, sub the left ventricular outflow tract, if you will. And so it, you know, you make part of the right ventricle, the neo left ventricle in this baffle. <clears throat> so if that area is significantly smaller than the semilunar valve you're baffling it to, you're likely to develop obstruction. Now, some of the great arteries you're baffling it to are larger than normal. And so you may not have too much trouble. Um, and so there's no magic number. Um, but we sort of, we try to look in all dimensions at the VSD to try to assess <clears throat> whether we think it's going to be big enough. The surgeon has, can be challenged about how much they can enlarge it uh, without hope, without causing heart block, uh, without causing damage to an AV valve or things like that. So um, you have to take that into consideration as well. When I counsel a family <clears throat> who has double out their right ventricle, um, about with for two ventricle repair, I always counsel that there's a chance that the patient will have to come back for a second operation for sub uh, aortic obstruction, whether that be in the Tausig Bing type or in the sub aortic VSD type, so that they know and are prepared for that. Um, because sometimes later on, you can core out some of that muscle better than you can in a very small heart. No, I want to say some, every time you ask you difficult question, but one colleague from uh, mm -hmm. he was from uh, uh, Saudi, they he say that uh, dear Professor Cohen, that was a first class presentation and could not have been presented better. Oh, that's and lovely. Thanks <laughs> once again. So now the trouble is for academy because- uh, <laughs> That was very kind. Thank no, you. I have a simple question uh, coming to the past. Now we have a lot of technology and now we can give a lot of answer to the, the question. In your personal experience, if you again try to keep in your mind what was uh, in bidimensional echo, the roadmap that you follow to define uh, uh, what is uh, for uh, BSD closure, what is for a switch, what is for a forget the pulmonary artery. There is some, you know, suggestion that you can give to pediatric cardiologists that don't have three-dimensional echo. Yeah. Uh, what is the, I think, I, I realize in my experience that probably we have mostly considered clinical presentation, but right. I'm sergeant. And on the other side, I need that if you can tell us, people from all around the world, how to really, you come, you arrive to this way. Thanks. Yes, um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. It's, 
it can be very challenging, even in the most experienced of hands, sometimes we don't know the answer. One thing I always ask um, when I'm doing an echocardiogram on a patient who we think has have DORV is what the oxygen saturation is. Because to some degree that will help me in my mind before I even put the probe on the patient. Because if the oxygen saturation is completely normal, uh, it is unlikely that the patient has a subpulmonary VSD, right? Because the streaming from the LV to the great vessel that's closest to the VSD, if that's the pulmonary artery, you would expect some transposition physiology. You would expect some desaturation. So when the patient is desaturated, and of course, um, when there are other complicating issues like total anomalous pulmonary veins or other things, then this, this flies away off the table. But if this is the only lesion that you have, then knowing the oxygen saturation already sets the tone for you to, um, to know to some degree which great artery is closer to the VSD before you even put the probe on the chest. Once you put the probe on the chest, one of the things that's, that um, some people do is they take um, images in various planes of the heart, but I would advocate that particularly in complex anatomy, such as double outlet or right ventricle, that you must really take very slow sweeps. <clears throat> and that helps you to identify where the VSD is and then to try to assess where, which, which great artery is closest to it. And sometimes this can be very challenging, but you have multiple views that you can use to help you with that, particularly the subxiphoid views, particularly frontal and sagittal subxiphoid views, because they really show you the relationship of the great arteries to each other, as well as their relationship to the ventricular septal defect. And then parasternal views, because the parasternal views really help you highlight the infundibular anatomy, whether there is muscle under each great artery. And, um, and then in addition, the sub xiphoid view shows you the relationship of the great arteries to each other. Are they normally related? Are they parallel? Um, <clears throat> are they anterior, posterior to each other? Are they side by side? All of these features are important for the surgeon to know uh, prior to going to the operating room. So those are some of the things you can use uh, when you don't have fancy tools. Yes. So I'm sure that you have a good answer for this. The coronary abnormalities in this patient. Yes. They can have <clears throat> any of the coronary anomalies we see in transposition. Um, and it, it also, it will depend on where the aorta and the pulmonary artery are in relation to each other. So if the aorta and the pulmonary artery are side by side, you tend to see coronary anomalies such as circumflex from the right or single right coronary artery. You tend to see coronaries that pass behind the great vessels. Um, but, and if you have very anterior posterior relationship, you can also see anomalies. So the, there is no hard, I have not found uh, in the literature any hard and fast rule for what the coronary anomalies are in double outlet right ventricle. The only thing I would say is you should treat it like transposition and look uh, to try to identify where they're arising, but this becomes not, it's not so important in patients who have a subaortic VSD because you're not gonna go anywhere near the coronary arteries. It is important if you see a coronary crossing over the RV outflow tract, if you're trying to do a tetralogy-like repair, just like we see in tetralogy. But it is very important in the patients who are going to need an arterial switch, similar to what we see in transposition. Um, it can be challenging to tell in this disorder. And so some people will use additional imaging to help them, or often the surgeon just knows to try to identify them in the operating room if you don't have those tools available to you. Yes, I fully agree. It depends on the, probably in the position of the relation of uh, pulmonary artery and the aorta. It's, uh, Absolutely. Yes. So I have another one, then I, you will have time to answer if you want to say something about, because it's uh, something that the people like about Nikaido indication for this disease. 
<clears throat> I, you probably can answer that better than I can. Um, I, the well, Nikita, I like ahead. it too also because I talk, I talk a lot with Professor, he was here with Professor Nikaido. I really understand the philosophy and people lose it probably in other uh, disease. So I am curious to know your idea. I, I guess the, the question is um, with the difference in this setting compared to transposition um, is that often in this setting of double outlet right ventricle, you'll have sub pulmonary infundibulum. And so you would have to be able to get through all of that to be able to translocate the aorta closer to the left ventricle. Um, I, I think that some surgeons may think you can do that. And, and so it, it might be successful in certain cases. And certainly the notion is very attractive because you want to try to move the great vessel closest to the left ventricle to prevent subaortic obstruction later, which is obviously the goal of the Nikaido. So, um, but it will also depend on the coronary arteries and how they lay and whether you have to reimplant them it becomes a very big operation in that situation. Um, and so I think in the right hands, it can be done successfully. I think the subpulmonary infundibulum probably adds some complexity to the problem. You, you with him, uh, we have, uh, it was an amazing uh, meeting and uh, he really explained that for him this surgery is for transposition, VXD. I see, interesting. Whatever you move from this indication, as you say, you, you were very perfect in this. Mostly of the patient that uh, they are using for uh, uh, double outlet, they will develop subaortic stenosis. Yes, right. This is, you know, you know him, he's a very simple person, very quiet. And for me, I'm still uh, in uh, working uh, decision making was very important because uh, as, as you say, Nikaido, cardiologists, they like, Nikaido, Nikaido. I think that uh, every time you move, for, for me, for example, Fontan operation is for tricuspid attrition. When you move, far from tricuspid atresia, you will have a lot of uh, problems. So for me, it's the same. I am very, I like to do in this way. So I think that your answer was, uh, I don't think it's only the hands, I think is uh, the, ana the anatomy and the BSD, the position, the position. Of Absolutely. So thanks again. I will leave you uh, question and answer open. You have uh, yes, 20... I will. Uh, I'll try to answer the questions that are in the chat room um, at the end. Um, I'm going to come off the camera, but I wanted to thank everybody for spending the last hour with us. And uh, you'll get a different point of view from Professor Anderson next week. I look forward to hearing it myself. Um, but he and I like to discuss this all the time. Um, and um, if anybody has any other questions, they can reach out to me. Thank you so much, Sasha. You, Mariel. We will see soon, uh, and uh, 300 people was following you from, I cannot tell you, you will see on the chat from all over the world. So Fabulous. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody, for spending time with me. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.